Kentucky basketball picked up a solid win over Illinois State, and they are continuing to prove that they can score pretty much at will at times. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on into Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Daw, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. Today's episode, we are going to be recapping Kentucky basketball's 96 to 70 victory over the Illinois State Redbirds. Going to talk about the positives, some of the negatives from this one, and then just look forward to to the new year. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind everyone out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, would really appreciate it if you subscribed to the show. If you're listening on podcast, I would appreciate it if you subscribed there as well. A little bit under the weather, have lost my voice, sort of, but we are going to push through today and talk about this contest that the Wildcats just essentially got out and ran in. Obviously, it was tightly contested for, I want to say, about 10 minutes, uh, very similar to a couple of different contests that we've already seen uh, earlier this season for UK, most notably the one most recently against Louisville. That game was very competitive, back and forth, back and forth. Illinois State hanging in it, hitting hitting a couple of different shots. Um, But as the second half continued to go on, uh, the Wildcats pulled away, and then they started the second half strong, uh, which was very impressive to see. The big thing I want to start off here with today is the fact that Kentucky wasn't really looking like they were sweet sleepwalking. I think they have recovered very well ever since that loss to UNC Wilmington just for the that entire first half, not really being able to get anything going on the offensive end of the floor, um, partially due to the fact that they just weren't hitting shots, but also it did not feel like they were being wise uh, with their shot selection and the the way that they were operating their offense. And this one, uh, they look solid from front to back. I, I don't really have a whole lot of complaints or anything uh, to criticize here as far as the way that UK's uh, w- was playing. Uh, in this one, they had 27 fast break points, and that's why the episode today is titled What It Is. Kentucky just simply got out and ran. You saw several moments where, and we've, we've talked about this throughout the, be- uh, throughout the beginning of the season, looking at the way Kentucky has broken down various opponents uh, that are uh, underneath their caliber of play, typically. They have, on rebounds, or defensive rebounds, turnovers, and baskets coming out of bounds, thrown the ball up the court as quickly as they can, and they're looking to score at the rim. You saw Rob Dillingham get a couple of cherry pick pick buckets in this game. I believe you saw Jordan Burks as well get one. You got on Yenzo where he was just streaking to the rim and was left wide open on a dunk. So many different opportunities for UK in the fast lane in this contest. I was a, I was really uh, excited to see UK just kind of go out and play with some flow. And statistically, I think their numbers reflect, uh, reflect that as well. I was concerned heading into this contest that we will uh, we would see um, a, a little bit of an inefficient shooting night from across the board, um, but Kentucky was able to get it done uh, from beyond the arc. That's my second biggest takeaway uh, from this one. 44% from beyond the arc were the Wildcats in this one, 38% in the first half, and then 50% in the second half, 6 of 12 uh, in that second period. Again, just solid offense all around from UK. The pacing, the shooting, the scores getting involved, it was a great night for uh, for what UK wanted to do on that end of the floor. Antonio Reeves, that's the player we've got to talk about here to start things off. 27 points on 10 of 15 shooting. Four of eight from beyond the arc. He had six total rebounds, two assists, and a plus minus of plus 20 in his 27, or excuse me, in his 34 minutes of play. 27 points, and it feels kind of quiet. Uh, I've seen several people point this out on Twitter, not just for this game, but also for various ones throughout this season with the other options that Kentucky has in their backcourt. It feels like at times Antonio Reeves, whether he is having a good game, an average game or a bad game, 
kind of gets left in on the back burner. And we tend to focus on what Reed Shepard is doing, what Rob Dillingham is doing. DJ Wagner, I think, had an excellent game in this contest. We focus on what those various guards are doing, but we don't really pay attention to the leading scorer of this of this team, which is Reeves. He kind of gets his big time moments in the quiet ones during scoring streaks where he is at the tail end of somebody starting something or he is kind of in the mix there to kind of get it going. He's not really, um, it, it's interesting. He is the the star scorer of this team, but it's, he's never consistently, I think, shown as the star scorer whenever Kentucky makes their spurts, basketball being a game of runs, whenever Kentucky consistently makes these different offensive runs throughout contests that you see against teams like this, and then whenever you see them against bigger teams like Miami or North Carolina, you don't really think about what Antonio Reeves is is doing in those moments until you look up at the stat sheet at the end of the game. You're appreciative in the moment, obviously. I'm not saying you're just lo- you're just looking away whenever he, he makes a shot attempt, but you don't really appreciate the efficiency and the val- and the volume of what he is doing to shoot 15 shots, half of them essentially from beyond the arc, and to shoot plus 50 percent from uh, from deep, and then shoot 10 of 15 from the floor. That's very impressive. I think we need to give Antonio Reeves his due credit, although there have been some inconsistent moments, and there will be. No shooter is perfect. Things are going to happen. Uh, he has had a very, very solid start to 2023. We will see if he can carry it into the 2024 side of the schedule, um, but Antonio Reeves, I think, has one of, been one of the bigger uh, bright spots here. Uh, for the Wildcat offense, and he showed out in this one. Kentucky and their scoring output is something else I want to get to here as well. Kentucky has had a a lot of 90-point games under John Calipari throughout the course of his tenure. Tristan Ferris, at Tristan UDA on Twitter, uh, decided to take a look at these different 90-point games across various seasons in 2015 through the 2016 season, or that 15-16 season, Kentucky had 14 90-plus point games in 2016-17. They had six in 17-18. They also had six, and then they did not have more than three for three straight seasons. 2021-22, they had seven 90-plus point games. And in 12 games so far this season, they have six. Six 90-plus point games, which is very, very, very impressive for Kentucky to have started this hot. 101 points against Stonehill, 96 points against St. Joseph's, 118 against Marshall, 95 against Miami, 95 against Louisville, and now 96 against Illinois State. The Kentucky offense is out and rolling. I want to continue here and talk about some of the other positives, talk about some of the other uh, players that really shine uh, in this game. Uh, Before we get to that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. You can keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit. Only available to U.S. customers. All right, continuing along here on the Friday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. Really appreciate you making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. If you have not subscribed to the show already, please go ahead and do so. It is very entertaining, the fact that I can't hit higher uh, notes right now with my voice. If you're listening on podcast, I would really appreciate it. If you subscribed there as well. Okay. The first player that I want to talk about here outside of Antonio Reeves is Rob Dillingham, who had another really solid night. All four of Kentucky's guards in this game, by the way, double-digit scores, the only four 
for the Wildcats that scored in double digits. How about that, by the way? 96 points from this team and four players in double digits, all of them being your guards. Rob Dillingham, 5 of 10 from the floor in this one at 16 points, made all of his uh, shots at the charity stripe. He had three total rebounds, but he had seven assists, only one turnover, and that gave him a plus minus of plus 27, which was second best on the team. We will get to the player who had the highest plus minus. In just a second, I'm going to go back to Twitter here to credit another uh, person who found an interesting stat. Sean Vinzel of Hoops Insight, front of the program, uh, had an interesting stat about Rob Dillingham and his ability to distribute and make an impact on the court in this game specifically. According to Sean Vinzel, Ron, uh, Rob had uh, assisted or an assist on 47% of the baskets his teammates made when he was on the court tonight. And then Sean Vinzel, uh, Vinzel uh, threw in a, a comment here considering he's always on the court with either Shepard or Wagner too. That is insane playmaking. Go look on Kim Palm if you have a subscription and look at the assist rate for these very different uh, for these various teams. Um, you don't have to go do it right now. You can do it at some other point. Or if you don't have a Kim Palm subscription, I'll read it here for you. The assist rate for Rob Dillingham is 32.7%, which is 50th among players nationally. nationally. That's very solid. The assist rate for Antonio Reeves is 86 So obviously, as we've discussed, Reeves more of a natural scorer, not necessarily somebody you involve in the, uh, in the passing game here. But DJ Wagner and Reed Shepard also have plus 20% assist rates. Wagner at 201 Shepard at 24.9%. That is genuinely impressive that Rob Dillingham has been able to make such an impact for Kentucky on the court as he has against good teams like Kansas, against bad teams like Illinois State. Rob Dillingham has been a very ball-dominant guard whenever he's been, in the, uh, been on the floor, and he's not been inefficient with the basketball. He's not been ball-hogging. Uh, as some people may want to claim if they see a player with the ball in his hands a lot. He is really shooting very well, uh, I, I would say, all things considered, uh, compared to where we were going, where we expected him to be at the beginning of the season. We expected Dillingham to be like a subpar three-point shooter, a streaky shooter is what we expected him to be. Uh, but you go and look at his numbers right now, currently shooting 47% from the floor, and then as a whole this season, he's shooting 44% from beyond the arc. And then on top of that, he's been a great, very uh, solid distributor of the basketball. I believe that seven assists is like, it, it ties for his third best game of the season in, in that category. I think he had nine uh, against Miami, if I'm not mistaken. And then I think he had a, a really solid game against Marshall too. Uh, I, I don't have that pulled up, but I could, I could check in a second. Um, Rob Dillingham, most uh, ball dominant point guard Kentucky has. And uh, he's been, very efficient with his minutes. DJ Wagner, another player that we need to highlight here. 14 points on 6 of 10 shooting. He had 3 assists to only 1 turnover. Had a plus minus of plus 13 and his 29 minutes of play. Uh, Wagner crossed a dude up in that first half. That was smooth. Um, <clears throat> there were a couple of different um, moments in this game defensively for Wagner that I'm sure he would like to have back where there were a couple of breakdowns and then Kentucky struggled to uh, give him help. Uh, at different times, but very efficient night for uh, for DJ Wagner offensively. And then to look at another guard that played well for Kentucky, who just continues to fill up this stat sheet, Reed Shepard, 11 points, four of eight shooting. He had five rebounds, five assists, two blocks, two steals, and 24 minutes of play. Gave him a plus minus of plus 25. Another really solid night from Reed Shepard. And if you're looking there alongside me, we'll go ahead and add it up here. I've not actually had the chance to look at this. 27 points from Antonio Reeves. 14 points from DJ Wagner. 16 points from Rob Dillingham. And 11 points from Reed Shepard. Those four guys at 68 of Kentucky's 96 points. I find it interesting in this game that Justin Edwards finished with a plus minus of zero in 20 minutes of action. He did have uh, a clumsy turnover that was confusing, to be honest with you. And then one of four from beyond the arc was, I, I mean, to be honest, I, I appreciate the 50% shooting that he had overall. The rebounding, uh, a couple of assists, a couple of steals. Um, 
we have we we have so many other options. Kentucky does shooting the basketball that uh, you're not necessarily relying on Edwards to be uh, a consistent outside shooter. And uh, through what now we're looking at uh, twelve games through the season, it's not looking like that's going to be the case. Um, but he does so many different other things very well. I'm surprised that he finished with a plus minus a plus zero. I thought his stats and the way that he actually operated in this game were not. The, we're not that bad. I mean, it, you, this was what uh, a twenty-six point victory. Um, Kentucky, Kentucky should consistently across the board, minus their bench players, have guys that are uh, in that plus-minus range of somewhere between like what five to thirty, which is what one player had tonight. So, uh, just thought I would point that out. And then the leader in plus-minus, we'll talk about him. Trey Mitchell had a plus-minus of thirty, as I just mentioned, only eight points, but he had eleven rebounds and then four assists a block, zero turnovers. Trey Mitchell continues to be the versatile big man that Kentucky desperately needed at the beginning of the season. He has been so, so good for the Wildcats so far. And him to for him to be able to go out there and prove that he can rebound a little bit was nice. Um, the negative, I think the biggest negative for me uh, from this game was the rebounding margin, speaking of, which is a smooth transition to some of the bad things that we saw in this game. Uh, Kentucky got out rebounded in this game, forty-five to forty. Uh, Twenty-four offensive rebounds for Illinois State. They had twenty-one defensive rebounds. I want I, I, I want to back this up for a second. Kentucky is not a phenomenal offensive rebounding team. In fact, they're one of the worst in the SEC, if I'm not mistaken. They're not great at getting to the foul line. They're not great at creating a lot of second chance opportunities or creating oppor- uh, opportunities at the charity stripe. I mean, that's it feels like that's just kind of what they are. If they could do that at a slightly better clip, this would be the most unstoppable offense in all of college basketball. But they don't, and they struggle at times to rebound. Is it an effort thing? Is it just the way that the ball has bounced this year? Is it just they faced off against a lot of really solid rebounding teams? I don't think that is particularly the case. But I think it is important to note that a team that is just statistically okay to somewhat good at grabbing offensive rebounds in Illinois State. I believe they're top 110 uh, in that category uh, in the country. Grabbed more offensive rebounds than defensive rebounds, and they out-rebounded a top 10 team. You cannot have dominance on the boards like that at any point in the SEC, in the, during the SEC slate, because you're not going to be shooting 57% from the floor, 44% from three, while also putting up a significant amount of shots. Um, also, by the way, just a weird note here, Kentucky didn't turn the ball over in this game a ton, six turnovers, but Illinois State outshot them 63 shots to 79. They were playing at a significantly faster pace than they normally do. And that's something that we broke down on the show. It's like, well, they do like to chuck up these different types of shots, but they don't play with a fast pace, so how they operate against UK, who loves to run up and, up and down the court, will be interesting. Um, they had more turnovers than Kentucky. They also had one more uh, second chance point, uh, 15 to 14. You cannot allow that to happen. You cannot allow that to happen because you're going to run into a couple of teams in this league that do like to chuck up some shots, who will get those second chance points, and will capitalize and hurt you. Texas A&M is the team that I'm looking at here in just, a, what, two weeks? You've got to be able to clean that up. You cannot allow that to happen. That was my, I think, my biggest issue in this one. Are there any other things that we would like to discuss here? I think it was very interesting that the uh, the guy that I identified as the most efficient shooter on this team in Kendall Lewis, uh, somebody that would be uh, maybe a problem for Kentucky's wings, was two of nine in this game with a plus minus of minus 13. Uh did not have an effective day at all. The Wildcats were able to keep him in check, uh, which was very solid for them. Uh, Foster Miles, the other forward uh, that was one of their lead guys, was 8 of 11 and had 20 points. So you give up one uh, one guy, like you shut down one guy, but you give up 20 points to another. I mean, it's whatever. Uh, the two guards, the two uh, guards for uh, Illinois State, Poindexter, and then Dalton Banks, were... Uh, were not uh, necessarily effective. Neither was uh, Darius Burford, uh, who finished 5 of 15. 
Banks finished four of 10, and then Poindexter finished five of 16. So Kentucky shut down the guys that mattered, and then Foster Miles had himself a day. But overall, uh, defensively, I was not mad at this effort. Kentucky dropped from 46 to 54th in defensive efficiency, according to Kim Palm, after this win. I don't get that because I don't think it was a necessarily bad day minus the offensive rebounds, which continue to kill Kentucky on their efficiency ratings. Got to be able to clean that up. Illinois State only shot 32% from the floor and 22% from three and 55% from the charity stripe. So if Kentucky can just grab some some extra boards, uh, they would be extremely dominant, I think. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore, and you can follow the show over on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave those in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all on Monday for another episode of Locked on Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.